So now, so now, yes. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, well, please welcome Eve on uh, Python in uh, finance. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, my topic indeed is Python for Finance. We do quite a bunch of things around this topic. Um, founder and managing partner of the Python Quants Group. Without further ado, I will dive into my little slide deck, but the major part of today's talk will be a live demo. Um, the agenda is as follows. A few words about our group, then I will cover what is called financial singularity, uh, just rather briefly to set a little bit of stage. Uh, what is driving forces in algorithmic trading because this is the major topic, uh, both of the talk and of what we do. Uh, the question, is a financial singularity possible, is also briefly touched upon, and what are the benefits of Python for finance? It's been a while since I've used such slides because now, actually, uh, Python has arrived in the industry. There's no arguing about it anymore. The biggest institutions in the world are using it. So uh, it's not kind of this uh, conquering the field. It's more like the question, how can we make best use of it? And the live demo will be structured along the three major topics that we typically cover, both in consulting, development, as well as in our training classes, financial data science, computational finance, and algorithmic trading. In this little graphic, you see what we all do in the field of Python for finance and algorithmic trading. The, the core is indeed training. Um, we are kind of proud to be the first to offer a university certificate. Uh, yesterday night when I attended, say, I bar camp in Frankfurt, there was kind of the discussion around uh, accepted qualifications and with regard to certification, so we can issue indeed a certificate from a German university which is valid all across Europe for five ECTS points, for example. We run a platform with close to 12,000 users doing data science and financial analytics in the cloud, in the browser, providing services to a bunch of companies. One of our current clients, FXCM from New York, we had a, a big webinar this week, 350 people. Um, all interested in algorithmic trading, mostly changing from uh, uh, maybe a classical trader to day trader. Now, uh, the, taking the ne next step to the algorithmic trader. If you're interested what I do otherwise, so I'm giving quite a bunch of talks and all the resources are typically posted on hippish.com. Currently, it's not up to date because I'm giving that many talks at this point in time, so I will try my best maybe on the weekend to update uh, the page and to find like videos, gist, slide decks and whatnot, all about Python for Finance. These are my three books, the most popular one probably being the uh, O'Reilly book. Uh, I've just signed a few weeks ago the, um, the contract for the second edition. So mid-2018, the second edition will come out. This one is from uh, the print edition, at least, from uh, end of 2014. And many, many amazing things have happened in our field. So it's, it's already time, a little bit over time, to come up with uh, the second edition in this regard. Here you see the, the brochure for our university certificate. Um, which is, I would say, our flagship offering at this point in time. Uh, we're currently in the second cohort for 2017. What is financial singularity? It's actually not about my talk. Uh, the talk is about why Python has taken over, but I think we need to put all the things that are happening right now in our industry in a little bit of a perspective. And uh, who has heard of technological singularity? Who knows what it is? Uh, not too many. Yesterday night at the machine learning and AI bar camp, there were more people. Uh, maybe it's dependent on the field. So it's, it's actually technological singularity defines some point, some future point in time from which on we, we might have, we will have machines that are as equally intelligent as we human beings. So we speak of general human intelligence or uh, maybe beyond that of super intelligence. You might have seen the book by Nick Bostrom, which is called Super Intelligence. Um, there are many, many words for it, but in principle it is uh, something like when Skynet has become conscious. So um, relating to the machine, obviously, of Terminator. But there is something that is called financial singularity. So before we might see the general technological singularity with machines being as intelligent as human beings, and in terms of general intelligence, of course, like creativity and all these things, uh, we probably see similar 
points in time and developments in other fields. And of course, I'm mostly concerned with the financial field. And this is the point at which all investment decisions are made by intelligent machines rather than human agents. When all human fallibility is eliminated from markets, efficient markets, which have only existed so far in theory, could become reality. So this is uh, from Investopedia. Nothing I have come up with, financial singularity. Um, but I think it's uh, one of the most exciting um, even if it's only a thought experiment, it's not one of the most exciting developments that we see right now. And some people, like here the Wall Street Journal you see above the screenshot, argue that we are almost close to it. So still, of course, there are human uh, beings involved in financial trading and buying, selling stocks. And um, there are also many, many retail traders. They're like gamblers are involved in markets and so forth. But if you have a look at the numbers, and this is kind of, I think it's hard to read, um, where you see above there this, um, the subtitle, it says that basically uh, trading is dominated by data-driven systematic quantitative funds. So by data-driven, this is kind of the, the major word here, and we know that to do proper machine and, and deep learning, so we need big, big data. And data availability, what, is, what has happened there is of course driving what we see here. So uh, many, many years ago, it wouldn't have been possible. Now we have the algorithms, we have the hardware, and of course we have the data as well. And fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which uh, point of view you have, we have rather structured data, and data is available for everybody. And um, also relating to a little discussion yesterday, it's kind of when people are arguing, of course, big data might not be available, for example, to the small and medium-sized German companies. How can they make proper use of deep learning, for example, if data is missing? But financial markets, everybody in principle has access to all the data. So it's not kind of like your own data, so you're dealing with data that is in principle publicly available. Major parts of the data need to be paid for, of course, but still it's not kind of that, that you have a disadvantage because you're small. In principle, if you have the means in terms of cash, you can subscribe to Bloomberg, to Thomson Reuters, Icon, for example. Then you have access in principle to all the data that the big players have as well. So there is not really a, a competitive disadvantage in this regard. But what are the driving forces in algorithmic trading? I think one of the most fascinating um, forces are that we in finance and algorithmic trading can make use of all the fantastic technologies that other uh, uh, people in other fields, uh, geniuses, come up with um, in the area of machine and deep learning. And in principle, when people are doing research on self-driving cars, what they come up with might be immediately transferable to the finance domain. So finance used to be kind of an applied mathematics discipline pride mind, sitting down, pen and paper, later on uh, computers and software, and coming up with some theory. So, but this was all finance oriented. But now we have kind of the, uh, the area of machine and deep learning, and we can make use of it. So it's, it's mostly transferable one to one. The major goal being automation probably in, in, in both areas. Uh, the self-driving car should be self-driving. It should be automated. And the money-making machine should be self-trading. It should be automated as well. So we speak typically of auto method algorithmic trading in this area. This is a chart that I use uh, for almost every training to structure it on a rather abstract level, what we do in algorithmic trading. And in principle, all the developments that we see in AI technologically and so forth influence every single layer that we have here, from the infrastructure to how we deal with financial data, how we formulate strategies, backtesting code. And every, everything in principle is influenced what we do there. And if we translate now, what is happening in the other areas to, to our field. So in principle, when we think of a human trader, back in the days, a human trader used to read maybe a financial paper. They're still reading research reports. They have a look at their Bloomberg terminal or Icon terminals. And then, given the information, they might want to trade. Of course, this can be replaced to a large part by algorithms. And this is happening in other fields as well. So the problem is not that dissimilar to Spotify having me, um, having me uh, compiled a list with uh, music that I might like, or Amazon, or Netflix, uh, recommendation, uh, prediction, everything. I mean, this is all pretty, pretty similar to what we have in other, other fields. Uh, what I find really fascinating, because I'm a financial engineer by training, I, I did my PhD work in mathematical finance, about option pricing, dynamic hatching, so coming really from this modeling point of view, 
basic idea and the basic approach throughout history has been like, we see something in financial markets. X might be here, a huge vector, a cube, whatever data, however big this might be, and we see something like Y, which is the outcome. Price going up, price going down, or, or whatever we can think of. And finance history was more or less driven by the geniuses, the brains who sat down, pen and paper, mathematical education. They came up with a model, let's say Markowitz with the portfolio theory, one of the cornerstones, or Cap M, Sharp Lindner, and so forth. They came up with a model, mathematically elegant model a single equation, so to say. And then they set out and tested the model in the markets. And unfortunately, most of the models don't really work in the market. So here when I write f of x is not equal y, it means that most of the times we hardly have any empirical support for the models used. Still, still up until today. And it's hard to believe for some accountants or whatnot that they believe that cap M is something like a yeah, let's say physical law in finance. Well, we don't have that many laws, actually. Uh, but still, finance history was true by that. And now, once AI can be used in our field, of course, we have all the nice things, and, and we simply have this data-driven view, dataism, whatever we want to call it. Say, well, the data, the market is right. Let's have a look at the data, and maybe we are not uh, capable of coming up with something. Uh, so let's apply all the technologies. My talk is not really about machine learning and deep learning, but in principle, this is for me like the fantastic thing to not say, well, I need to sit down, I need to come up with, no, I let the machine have a look at it. And the next talk, I will go to it, is about feature extra automatic features, extraction from time series, really looking forward to it with uh, TS Fresh, for example. So this is, this is kind of the way maybe we might want to go about it. And I was really reminded yesterday during the keynote uh, with regard to atoms only make up kind of 4% of the mass in the universe and some Somehow I have to feel in the finance field is similar. You know, we are talking about all the things, we have a feeling for something, but I, st I think there is still that much missing, and maybe with the new approaches that we have, um, new paradigms, new view of the finance world, we might come up with uh, new solutions. We are still at the beginning. Here's a quote from book 2015. Still at the beginning in this area. Actually, uh, many more things to see. I think the progress is uh, picking up momentum here in this regard. Many, many um, companies uh, with huge budgets, uh, because uh, usually in finance there's lots of money involved, therefore they have huge technology budgets, like Goldman Sachs having five billion per year technology budgets. So, uh, th there is lots of power behind it, um, and I'm pretty sure that we will see amazing th things there coming. Is a financial singularity possible? I don't know. Uh, but here's one example, if we, if we would define financial singularity as having a machine available that makes profit without error, so to say, who trades in the markets and uh, creates wealth without being fall fallible. Uh, there's one example. It's, it's, uh, uh, the company, it's hard to read due to the resolution, I'm sorry for that. Um, it's a company um, having, let's say, 140 traders and the fantastic thing here in this article is from June from Bloomberg, and when they reported results, I said, well, over the last 34 months, we haven't made a single loss on a monthly basis, which is noteworthy in and of itself. Then, once again, it's probably really hard to read, at least on the upper left. Uh, they said, well, we, we have a distinctive approach to algorithmic trading, so they are using algorithms. Uh, the algorithms deterministic rather than statistic, which is kind of the, the norm. Um, they make tiny margins, tiny profits on every single trade. But due to the volume, they trade over the year more than one trillion worth of uh, financial instruments. I mean, there's a little bit of profit to make uh, if, you, if the volume is high, even if the margins are as thin as you see it here. But uh, the most uh, interesting statistic that they report is that over the 34 months, they haven't had a single day with a loss. So they are making profits on a daily basis by using algorithms to trade in markets. I don't think that there are many other examples out there, hedge funds, individual traders, or whatnot, who have a similar P&L history to report about. So this might be a glimpse. I don't know that many details, obviously, about what is going on, but if I would think of a financial singularity, and would ask me the question if this is possible, this is something I would say, well, Financial singularity might mean something like that. Of course, 34 months and as many days might not be kind of proof of it, but maybe it's an indication for what might be possible if you 
uh, use today's technologies kind of uh, properly. And I think, once again, from all the nice developments in other areas, like here, TensorFlow being open sourced uh, quite a while ago, just recently the uh, Google AI initiative announced with the, with the cloud TPUs available to almost everybody in the future, uh, at least, um, I think these are all developments from which the financial fee will uh, benefit. And for sure, and this is nothing I want to touch upon, uh, we might need to ask where does this lead to? Um, I can think basically of three scenarios, like one, monopolizing everything, like the Googles in the world, having one field and dominating that, like having an uh, oligopoly with a couple of big players uh, sharing the cake. Um, might be similar to Bitcoin, currently the, the, big, uh, the, the big Bitcoin uh, group, so to say, the only relevant ones when it gets to Bitcoin mining, or it will become like the technology in the process will become a commodity, so you can't make any money anymore there. I'm not arguing here about that one. The only thing that I argue is that I think this is one of the most amazing um, developments we have seen in finance that AI is taking now such a huge and uh, prominent place in our field, and I'm really uh, happy about it because it's exciting, new, it's fantastic. And given the background that I mentioned before, I'm really fascinated to have something new in our field. What are the benefits of Python for Finance? I said this, it's a while ago since I needed to, to argue about this. Uh, I think I don't need to argue here in, uh, uh, in this context about it. Uh, but the only thing that uh, I want to say is that typically when I then speak to people who haven't that much experience with Python or other languages, this is what I typically communicate. So um, just not going through it also in, in view of the, the time left. I rather want to focus on the live demo, and if you're interested, I've posted all the codes that I'm now going to use on Google, on, not on Google, sorry, this is just a short link in a gist. So I'm going to use three Jupyter Notebooks, and all the three Jupyter Notebooks with the link to the slides uh, can be found in this gist. You can also Google gist uh, efilpish, and I think Google will do the job as well so that you don't need to type in here this little code. Three topics. Financial data science is the first one. Uh, we use the term financial data science in principle for everything that is data-related, data logistics, I like to say as well. Um, so I'm going now to execute this little thing. If you're not that deeply involved in the field, there might be some... Uh, maybe lines of code or things that I'm going to cover that might not be clear. It's not that much about the details that we're going to cover. It's rather to have a couple of plots and a couple of things to have a look at and to see how Python can help with the problems in finance. Of course, I'm going to use pandas, not task and parallel. This is very simple, simple, simple example. Here I'm reading data from a local uh, CSV file. This is, in principle, a very small data set, 1960 data rows only from the beginning of 2010 to 13th of October. So for a couple of names like Apple, Microsoft, Intel, Amazon, Goldman Sachs, uh, then the ETF, the S&P 500, the VIX um, index, Euro, US dollar exchange rate, and for gold. So I'm just going to work with a subset. But the small data, really, really far away. You see 168. Uh, kilobyte. Of course, for everybody doing interactive analytics, for us Python people, this might be all um, stuff that is maybe boring. I've seen this a thousand times, but for some financial analysts coming with a different background, maybe just having used Excel so far, they see, oh, well, this is not that involved. You know, it's just like a single line of code, and this guy generates a graph here. It's even easier than with Excel, where I need to move around things and, and annotations and blah, blah, blah. I think it's, it's even easier than in Excel, indeed, to create a plot out of it. Also, the importing of data, I mean, this is not really coding. Nothing that I'm going to show is from my point of view, programming, coding, or whatnot. It's kind of a high-level API. Pandas does the trick. And for example, adding statistics, simple moving averages. We would say like maybe trends in finance or simple moving average. We use rolling, calculate the mean, and can immediately plot kind of three lines, picking out the euro US dollar exchange rate. So with seven lines of code, I have formulated already the basis for a trading strategy, SMA trading strategy, something used since decades to do investments in the markets. Then to say, well, if the green line is above the red line, or here it's, yeah, exactly, the green line, SMA1 is above the red line, then I want to be long the market, otherwise I want to be short. It's a single line of vectorized code, and I have my positions defined. So it's, it's even, I think, less effort than 
get this done in Excel, you know, having this all and going through the cell, copying and whatnot. This is always my benchmark when people are pretty, pretty new. When they come from another programming background, R or whatnot, they might also see some benefits in here. But I say, well, if you don't want to do kind of real development work, the first steps are pretty easy. And here you see the positioning, like long, short, long, short, what we do in financial markets, like on, on trading platforms, for example, we could immediately implement such a strategy. And then I say, well, let's see how the strategy performs. A couple of calculations further, like lock returns. Then I multiply my position with the lock returns. I do a drop in a come sum, apply exponential function, and do the plotting. So a series of method calls, and I have my plot and can compare the performance. So in less than, let's say, 15 lines of code, when we skip out the ones that are not necessary, uh, really, I can import data, I can add statistics, I can derive a positioning in the markets, and I can do a proper, concise, vectorized backtesting. I think Pandas is, is really a fantastic tool to accomplish all these things. Also, when I teach this to students, uh, I think this is easy, easy uh, enough to learn, even with not a computer science uh, background. Some statistical analysis. Here, two time series, S&P and the VIX. I can plot them, subplots here, or like in a single plot, and the basic idea is that they are negatively correlated. So, but I can now analyze this a little bit in more detail. I mean, here we might get an idea of the negative correlation. You see, whenever the green one goes up, the blue one goes down, and vice versa. So, if there is some causation, I don't know. It's not what I'm talking about, but there is at least, obviously, some correlation going on. I calculate single line of code with the two columns picked out, the returns, and I can then, for example, use Seaborn, which gives me this nice um, joint plot here, even with a Bayesian regression through it. So it's a single line of code, and all the financial analysts are usually kind of amazed to see this. To see this. Now many people might say, oh, well, this is all boring. This is kind of just bitmap, it's map.lib, but I want to show you something that is kind of special for um, what we do here. And finance, it's uh, who is using Plotly for plotting? D3GS. Oh, not that many. You, you should give it a try. So I'm picking out here a couple of uh, data sets. So this would be kind of a boring bitmap plot. Now I'm using cufflinks, which gives me I plot to the data frame. So instead of DF plot, I can do DF I plot. It's just this one method, but it's something like magic. Um, and when I do the plotting now, instead of uh, this non-interactive, I have now a D3GS plot here uh, in, and it's in, in principle, once again, it's just a method plot here. It's data, column, dot, I plot, with a couple of parameters. Kind lines gives me this uh, linear regression to the data set. But there are also basic quant figures, and this is what finance people are interested in. So here I have open, high, low, close data, and when I want to draw some candlestick data, this is taken care of by the, um, um, the cufflinks library. So I see here we have nice open, high, low, close visualization. And this is all interactive once again, can zoom in, can zoom out, and uh, do all the nice things. But not to stop here in terms of finance, I can add some studies, like the simple moving averages we have seen from before. Now I have, once again, interactive graphic. I say, well, I want to get rid. I click on this here, and some Bollinger Bands. This is now, of course, all financy stuff. So to say, I get Bollinger Bands with a shaded area, two times standard deviation around this, or something like a relative strength index. So all interactive can be clicked on. I can zoom in. I can now do my interactive analytics uh, with that stuff. So given the time, I have prepared the computational finance example, but I want to show uh, quite a very simple uh, application of TensorFlow for Prediction, um, feel free, of course, to have a look at the gist. Um, computational finance, usually the major argument is that Python in combination with NumPy and Pandas is fast enough to do even some things like a Monte Carlo simulation and, and stuff like that. So the data set is basically um, the same here. What I'm going to derive are now features uh, for, my, for my learning. And features are the simplest case we can think of. We just have historical returns, maybe the sign of it, or we can categorize it a little bit more granular. But I'm going here in, in the most simplest fashion. 
So what you see is that I just have zeros and one. So very simple, I'm just here interested in, is the market going up or is the market going down? And this is the only question that I ask and this is represented in my features. Getting rid of the, um, the incomplete data sets, I can import TensorFlow. This is now not the fastest stuff here on my machine. This is a four and a half year old uh, MacBook uh, Air, but it still works, even on this small machine. Uh, getting the data ready, so first I define my feature columns, then the callback function providing the data. You see just a couple of lines of code. And creating the model here, I'm using a deep neural network classifier. Two hidden layers are 50 units, providing the feature columns. And I'm already ready to do the learning. So you see the, the preparation is not that intense. This is just basic pandas, a little bit of shifting stuff around creating five simple feature columns, the most simple case I can think of. Uh, then I do the learning. This might take, I don't know, five seconds here, 250 steps. Network not too large, of course, but still it's I3, four gigs of flow. <laughs> um, and when I evaluate now the prediction, and the basic question that I answer here is kind of, uh, or ask is uh, provide me a prediction whether the market will go up or down tomorrow given the last five days. So I have a look at last week on a Monday. I say, what was last week, Monday, Tuesday, until Friday? And what does this probably imply here? Of course, no certainty involved for Monday. Will the market go up or down? It would be nice to have something in this regard. Uh, the accuracy level here is uh, 54%. This is what we call hitch ratio in the market. Maybe not the only uh, relevant uh, figure, but let us see how this translates. And you have seen already the back test with the kind of two, um, two uh, lines, one going up, the other going down. And now let me see what is in here with deep learning. And at least in sample, of course there is no testing, no validation, this is all in sample. When I use this DNN, this very simple DNN classifier, five legs, just two categories and so forth, uh, you see the green line, which is the strategy. So if I would have known and would have the model as fitted as I have it now beforehand, uh, the market, you see the blue line, market here in this case is the euro sell exchange rate, exchange rate goes down and the green one goes up. So in principle, I can train my model, but the trick now is, of course, and, and the, the major obstacle to translate this into out-of-sample performance. So this is not what I wanted to show. The, the argument that I wanted to make is how easy it is with a couple of lines of code here to have a, yeah, let's say, complete <laughs> DNN classifier trained based on our historical data and so forth. So not arguing about feature selection. This is uh, probably a good way, if you're interested in, in this particular part, to go to the next talk uh, about TS Fresh. But uh, my point here is to show how concise and how easy it is, even for the non-computer scientists, for the hardcore programmer, to make use of the nice technologies. Once again, here is the uh, gist with um, the link to all the resources. And I, I'm not surprised that Python has taken over finance. I believed in it more than 10 years ago when almost nobody believed in it. I'm happy that it, w it turned out as it did. So I'm really excited and looking forward to another fantastic 10 years in the industry. Thank you. Of course, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, we are. still have time for one or two questions. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I would be very interested in knowing whether you have any numbers on the actual uh, adoption rates of Python in the industry over the last 10 years, and also regarding the technologies that you were talking about. So maybe if you heard about prominent examples of adoptions of AI technologies in the last two or three years, that would be very interesting. I think the first question is more easy to be answered because Python is now a core technology for almost every major player in the industry. All the big banks, starting with Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, the biggest bank in the world, 350,000 people, uh, uses Python as core technology. I think it's one of the biggest uh, Python systems in the world um, in production. It's called Quartz, risk, and tra risk management and, and trading environment for them. Same holds true for JP Morgan, but all the other banks all use Python. 
BNP Paribas, Deutsche Bank. It's for me hard to tell who's not using. Same holds true for the hedge funds, for the buy side, as well as the asset managers. It's hard to tell a hedge fund or to identify a hedge fund who doesn't use it. Um, the biggest ones like Two Sigma, AQR Capital Management, uh, PTT Partners, uh, some of them, our clients, um, they all make use of it. So penetration, I wouldn't say, of course, 100%. This might not be true, and also to different degrees, but I think it's kind of everywhere and every place. With regard to AI, I think this is still something everybody's talking about, but almost nobody is kind of revealing what exactly they are doing. So I would say, well, everybody's interested, everybody's kind of... Uh, trying to dig deeper, same holds true like for blockchain, you know, everybody has been talking about more last year than this year, at least from my perception, but what they are really doing with it is kind of a different question and how far they have gotten. I think on the retail side, uh, in banking, uh, it's used like for credit scoring and everything, it's, it's kind of standard technology, it's not something special, it's something that is used, uh, classification, all these approaches um, since, since years. On the corporate investment banking side, where, where we are mostly uh, working, um, it's hard to tell because it's still new, not too new. Everybody is looking into it, but of course, if they have found something, they're not walking around and, and showing others uh, what they have found. So that's my take on it. Last, Last question. One quick one. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's a more of a general question. The European Commission is uh, pushing to open up uh, financial transaction history. And a financial what? A transaction history for yeah. uh, all yeah. your banking accounts. Uh, in Holland, it's a big uh, point of discussion. Sure. I can assume yeah. the same as in Germany because you yeah. like your privacy. What's your opinion on this? How will it impact these big learning, uh, big data and machine learning positions? I think it, I think it opens up, of course, a couple of, uh, couple of things. The one is, of course, that you, you on your own can benefit from it. You, know? you, you can, for example, you can attach your stuff to platforms that can make data science for you. If you're a Python programmer, you can use it for yourself. But of course, there come data security and, and, and data protection issues up with it. Uh, in principle, to, to have the, something like this in place, I don't think it doesn't hurt. The question is how to deal with it. Uh, I think we would see many, many more things, and I just recently read about a, um, a startup who is exactly picking this up, of course, and, and trying to come up with some, let's say, individualized financial planner who says, well, I see you have uh, your monthly electricity bill is like that. We're working with the comparison platform. We can use your data and immediately forward it. So all these models will come up. It's the same like with having Alexa in your home. Uh, the question is, in the end, how can you control what is really happening? You know? It's usually like we, we get kind of the 100%. <laughs> say, well, yeah, take it all. Uh, but we, we don't know what's happening with it. So, of course, there, I see uh, many, many risks there and dangers probably, but I think this is what we see in many, many other areas as well, not only with regard to uh, our bank accounts and the history in there. Tax authorities might also get access to it. Yeah, it's kind of like different, different areas. Okay, thanks, guys. Have a good time here.